Hello, I am Brooke Clement, and as Acting Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's program, Energy Crisis, Nixon, Ford, Carter, and the Hard Choices in the 1970s with author Jay Hakes. An expert on U.S. energy policy, Jay Hakes has a long history of working on energy issues. He was the administrator of the U.S. Energy Information Administration under President Clinton and served as director for research and policy for President Obama's BP Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill Commission. Jay is also no stranger to presidential libraries, having served for 13 years as the director of the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. Tonight's program will begin with our speaker examining the energy crises Presidents Nixon, Ford, and Carter faced. Then a moderated discussion with Gleaves Whitney, executive director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation will begin. Audience questions will be incorporated into the question and answer portion of tonight's event. So please ask your questions in the comment box anytime during the program. Jay, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our virtual stage. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Brooke. Uh, and uh, thank you again for uh, helping me do my research in my days at the uh, Ford Library. Uh, as some of you might be aware, uh, I have some pretty good connections to the Ford Library. Uh, I spent part of my boyhood uh, uh, growing up in Grand Rapids and uh, Gerald Ford was my congressman. And of course I came back uh, for uh, some very enjoyable research that I did at the uh, archives in Ann Arbor. And then when my um, 2008 book came out, I did one of these old fashioned tours where I actually visited in person <laughs> Uh, in, in both uh, uh, Grand Rapids and Ann Arbor had uh, good turnouts. So I, I have fond memories of, of uh, uh, the Ford Library and it's a real pleasure and honor to be with you uh, tonight. Um, I thought I would talk a little bit initially about how books like this get written. Uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, research that goes into uh, writing about three different presidents. And uh, people today maybe assume, well, you just go on to uh, uh, the web and, and do a Google search and uh, check Wikipedia. Well, it's a lot more complicated than that. And the foundation for those of us who write about history or presidential history is the presidential libraries. Uh, they have vast, immense resources. And uh, it, even if you weren't writing books, it would be fun to go into these uh, records and, and study how different presidents handled uh, different issues. But uh, I, of course, spent uh, time at the uh, Nixon uh, records, both when they were in Washington and then when they moved out to California, uh, the Ford records, and then the Carter records in Atlanta. But uh, for those who are interested in that period, I, I would, uh, of the 1970s and, and the energy crises that we, we had during that period, uh, I would add three other places where I did research that I think added a lot of new uh, perspective to this book. One was the uh, archives of William Simon, who was the energy czar under Nixon and um, the, uh, Secretary of Treasury under President Ford. Uh, he was a graduate of Lafayette College in Pennsylvania, and so his records are there. Now, the Ford Library, uh, uh, I should say, and historians are grateful, have uh, made uh, copies of a lot of those records. So you can go to Ford and, and get those records as well. But uh, there was some other things there, and, and Simon kept all the news clippings and everything he kept. So that was a place that was helpful. Uh, second, I wanted to know more about the gasoline lines of, of that period. Uh, one reason I wrote the book, it was always kind of mysterious. You know, why did these gasoline lines occur sort of uh, where they did, when they did, um, kind of like unraveling the uh, colonial pipeline uh, uh, sh uh, shutdown that we had recently. And so I found that the uh, American Automobile Association had in their archives a survey of gasoline stations that they did every week, and they surveyed thousands of stations. So I was able to go down to Orlando, where this was located, 
and get some really much more exact uh, information about the shortages, which helped me, I think, explain them better. And then the third one uh, uh, was located in Columbia, South Carolina. University of South Carolina Library had the papers of former uh, South Carolina Governor John West. But after he was governor, uh, Jimmy Carter appointed him to be the ambassador to Saudi Arabia. And our relationship with the Saudi Arabia is always kind of mysterious uh, because there's a lot going on that's not made public. Uh, I think this is true really for all of our presidents. But um, he kept a diary and he also kept a lot of records. So I went there and uh, went through his diary, and I think it gives a perspective on our relationship uh, with Saudi Arabia that it would be hard to find anyplace else. So that, that's sort of the foundation of this work. The, the resources were so ample, uh, so vast, that I wrote what I thought was a, a pretty good 800-page book. Uh, but I, uh, most publishers don't like books that long. And so um, it's not, it came down to 400 pages, which hopefully is the best, the best part of uh, those 800 pages. It, for those who are interested in more, uh, write me and, and I'll share additional information. But during the 70s, we had uh, energy crises. And I, I say that in plural. A lot of people think of one crisis the Arab oil embargo, which occurred from uh, October of 1973 to uh, March of 1974. But I say there were five, uh, at least, energy crises during the 1970s that help us even understand where we are today as a country in dealing with our energy and environmental problems. One, of course, was this oil embargo. And it's a pretty amazing story when you get into it. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention one thing, but the, the day uh, that the oil embargo was announced, President Nixon and Secretary of State Kissinger had a meeting with the foreign ministers of uh, uh, Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And they were worried uh, that there might be a problem with oil supplies. But after the meeting, they were both gloating because they realized after this talk that there wasn't going to be an embargo. And that very day, the embargo was announced. And the reason I mention that is that is symbolic of a recurring problem uh, that communications with uh, the Middle East were always uh, uh, difficult and, and murky. And I think all three presidents uh, that I write about here occasionally were surprised by, by what happened. Uh, the, um, the second crisis was, um, uh, what was uh, the uh, shortage of natural gas that occurred when Carter took uh, office. Uh, Carter took office, it was a very frigid winter and the nation had a precarious natural gas supplies. So in many areas of the nation, they were shutting down schools. Uh, this wasn't as well known as the other crises, but uh, it certainly was a major factor. Then uh, in November and December of, uh, of 1978, there is a, a revolution against the Shah of Iran. Uh, the United States had what we call the two pillars of our Middle Eastern policy, or at least our Middle Eastern oil policy. And uh, these were Iran and Saudi Arabia. So that, uh, uh, the Shah eventually fled the country in January of 1979. And then the gasoline lines peaked in May and June of that year. But what my book is able to sh show is there were very tense talks going on with, the Saudi, with Saudi Arabia during this period about the extent to which Saudi Arabia would replace the, um, uh, Iranian oil. And sometimes they did, and sometimes they didn't. And uh, so that, that was another crisis. And then sort of in the midst of that, um, uh, we had the Three Mile Island accident, which is still today the major nuclear accident in US uh, history. And then uh, people forget that um, uh, several weeks before the presidential election in 1980, uh, Iran and uh, Iraq went to war which was another massive loss of oil to the world market. Now, by that time, 
largely because of things that Ford and Carter had done, we had cut our um, uh, oil imports by quite a bit. So that one wasn't really the, the punch in the face like the earlier ones, but it still was another signal that we were vulnerable uh, uh, because the Middle East was so unstable. So those are the, that's the subject matter. Now, in terms of theme, uh, I, um, I, I, if you can picture in your mind, there's a picture in the book that comes from the Ford Library. And it is uh, a picture of Henry Kissinger and Gerald Ford together. And what are they doing? They're inspecting the um, uh, Alaska pipeline. They'd gone up to Alaska and they had these thick parkas and they're both wearing hard hats. Uh, well, there it is, uh, the, the, the wonders of, of the digital world. So you can see uh, Secretary of State Kissinger there with uh, the glasses. And if you uh, have super duper eyesight, you can see on his hard hat, it says Secretary of State and uh, President Ford, of course, uh, on his hat, it says President of the United States. Now I picked it because I, I'd never seen this picture before. When you're kind of in the presidential library uh, world, you think you've seen most of the pictures uh, that, uh, that have been taken. But the archivists always have more than you've seen. So when this one popped, uh, was, uh, popped up on my screen, I said, that I, I've got to put that one in the book. But the more I think about it, it symbolizes two themes in the book. One is that foreign policy and domestic policy are intertwined in the day of the president and in the, on the subject of energy. Uh, if, you, if you read the president's daily schedule, uh, any president, they're dealing with a dozen different things that are unrelated to each other or apparently unrelated. So this Alaska pipeline is pretty important because it added 2 million barrels a day to US production and it delayed um, uh, for some time our growing dependence on foreign oil. But it, it had a lot of uh, international implications because Europe was really pushing us to, um, to import less oil and this was gonna help. So here you have the Secretary of State inspecting this oil pipeline in Alaska. The other thing that it illustrates to me, and, and I think it's a, a good point for everyone to recognize, that the, the 70s have a certain continuity. And I think that's true of all presidential history, but I was invited by one publisher to divide my book in two. And um, I, I didn't want to do that because I think the con continuity and the handoffs from Nixon to Ford to Carter are very important. They're a big part of the story. So the, the permitting of this pipeline was done under Nixon and Nixon had to decide, do we run the, the pipeline to, through Canada so it can reach consumers in the Middle West or do we run it to South uh, uh, Alaska where it has to be transferred to tankers uh, and he chose that. And, and it was a contentious issue. And at one point, Vice President Agnew had to uh, break a tie vote. But then most of it was built when President Ford was, um, was in office. And then uh, the oil started to actually flow early in Carter's presidency. So the, there's so many of these things that kind of cross presidential uh, terms uh, that it's always like, well, who should get the credit? Uh, and um, I'll get more into that later, but uh, uh, I, 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 I like the, the, there have been books written about foreign policy by Bob Gates and uh, Tim Weiner at the New York Times has written a book covering how numerous presidents have dealt with the CIA. I like that kind of book because I, I think a book uh, that takes a complex issue and just uh, pretends like that issue started and ended with one particular president. Uh, that's not the way it really uh, works in, in the real world. Now, um, another thing about that this book addresses is others have argued, uh, I think correctly, that the 70s showed the, um, the problems of overregulation by the federal government. 
And most of this came into play when uh, President Nixon was in office. Uh, he put in place both um, price controls, uh, first on the whole economy, but eventually just on energy. And he also uh, put the government in the business of actually allocating the oil uh, during periods of emergency. And um, that was something that um, uh, really got screwed up uh, in serious ways. Uh, it's, it's a little painful to me as someone who's had to testify before Congress and hopefully give them accurate statistics about what was going on to see how at that point in history, it was really hard to get a grasp on the data and they overestimated the shortage and some of the oil that was available was not allowed to go to market. And uh, the private sector can probably allocate uh, those supplies more efficiently than the government. So we had huge, um, huge outages. And uh, I, I think most economists and historians of others have said, you know, the government should really never go back to that kind of regulation. But I would argue that um, there was good regulation that went on too in the 1970s from all of the presidents and that uh, we need to caution that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And this was a decade of uh, the environmental movement, you know, Earth Day begins, um, e even before Earth Day, the, the mo motion, uh, the Congress was in motion to pass the Clean uh, Air Act of 1970, perhaps the most important national environmental uh, legislation on the environment. Uh, and even today, that's the legislation under which regulations can be issued uh, covering climate change. The, the uh, language of the bill was very broad. So that's going on in the background. We're gradually getting rid of all this smog in the cities and the lead in our gas that's not good for the health of children. And uh, it was interesting, a few years ago, they did uh, a ranking of the top five environmental presidents. Uh, this was before the last couple of presidents, but uh, of the top five, Nixon, Ford, and Carter were all in the top five American presidents when it came to the environment. This was done by uh, writers and environmental groups and people like that were surveyed. So that uh, we kind of forget that sometimes, uh, that that decade was an environmental decade. And true to the times, all presidents uh, were uh, uh, devoted to trying to make sure we, we cleaned up the environment. And all of them were wrestling about things like offshore drilling. And all three of them would say, you know, we need to drill as much uh, offshore to end uh, oil uh, dependence on, the, on foreign supplies as we can, but we have to balance that with protecting the environment. And, and then that says, well, how do you balance those two? And that's always a, a, a lengthy discussion, but all three really tried. And uh, other things, if you want to look at some of the hidden victories, uh, I would call them, of the 1970s, you need no, not look much further than the 1975 Energy Policy and Conservation Act um, signed by President Ford. Now, President Ford was not totally pleased with this legislation. It, it, he was dealing with the Democratic Congress. Uh, Frank Zarb of his staff was over there all the time dealing with the Congress and uh, nobody on either side got exactly what they wanted. However, there were a couple of breakthroughs in energy policy that as an energy historian, uh, I think are particularly notable. One is the uh, automobile efficiency standards. Uh, this was the pioneering legislation that allowed the federal government to um, uh, force automobile manufacturers to, to uh, deliver more efficient ve vehicles, basically to double uh, the efficiency of, of automobiles by the year 1985, uh, which we basically did. It got delayed a little bit. A, a second uh, thing uh, that nobody thinks that much about uh, is the uh, 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 establishment of a uh, strategic petroleum reserve of oil so that if we were interrupted in the future, uh, we would could draw on those stockpiles. So President Ford had uh, 
advocated for that. Um, the Congress thought it was a good idea. And so he passed the legislation. We had to build the storage facilities. That was uh, done under Carter. And then most of the oil was put into the uh, reserve when Reagan was president. So this is another example of a, a contribution to our national well-being that spans three presidents um, and uh, something that we forget about. But when you get to the first uh, Iraq war, uh, you know, there was this huge loss of oil from, uh, from Kuwait and Iraq. Um, and we were able to weather that for a number of reasons. Uh, but one of those reasons was we were sitting on this reserve of oil. So we, we were able to uh, maneuver much more successfully. So those are the kind of things that are going on where I, I think in hindsight, we would say the price controls that were put in in the early 70s probably were an example of, reg of regulation gone awry. But then we have some of these other things that when we look back on them, we say, well, that worked out pretty well. So this is the challenge for, uh, for policymakers uh, when they, um, when they uh, um, uh, you know, are wrestling with these things. But it's also something for historians to, to wrestle with. Now, I would point out that these regulations uh, of price controls were uh, started to be phased out by President Ford. Uh, President Carter took further steps to, uh, to deregulate oil prices. And then uh, uh, President Reagan finished the job uh, very early in his administration. So we, we haven't had them since 1981, and I don't think anyone's um, willing to uh, to say um, uh, w willing to uh, say that we should go back to them. Now, let me mention one other uh, aspect of the book. I, 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 at one time, I was going to have. Uh, different chapters on foreign policy and different chapters on domestic policy. And as I suggested earlier, that's not the way the White House works and that's not the way energy works. So uh, I try to tell this as a historical narrative in chronological order. And I think it is uh, uh, the best way to take what is potentially a very complex subject and make it more accessible to the reader, uh, in part because these personalities are, uh, are, are very interesting, the people we're talking about. Now, the three presidents, everybody's interested in presidents, but the people around them and work for them and are meeting with them are also very interesting people. So uh, by telling a historical narrative, you can uh, hopefully in, engage the reader uh, I wouldn't say it reads like a novel, but uh, but it, it does, I think, have the pace of, of going through. And when you're dealing with presidents, um, I get frustrated when someone talks about something in energy and they don't mention what year it happened. Uh, and it's hard to explain things if you don't have chronology. So I'm interested in the month or the day or certain days. Uh, I am interested in the hour. Uh, you know, there was one very interesting day in Carter's presidency, two days after the Camp David Peace Accord, uh, Camp David Peace Treaty was signed. He had on his schedule a meeting with the Solar Caucus about the future of solar energy, which from an energy standpoint was pretty important. He also knew that day he needed to uh, monitor developments in Saudi Arabia because it was unclear how much oil they were going to furnish to replace uh, uh, the Iranian oil that had been lost. And lo and behold, uh, just as he gets to the office, he's told we've had the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island. Uh, so those are just the three energy things that happened that day, let alone all the other things. So I try to give a flavor, uh, a, a little bit of what the day of a president is like, and then how all these energy um, issues play off of each other. And so I, I would give here a particular uh, pat on the back to the Ford Library uh, and the archives that they hold. Uh, I assume that some people that are listening are um, uh, have studied President Ford in some depth. Uh, but even those who have, 
may not be familiar with one of his aides named Mike Duvall. And Mike Duvall, uh, again, wasn't someone who appeared on camera, but he, behind the scenes, he's, he's kind of uh, managing a lot of the energy discussions. Uh, and from my standpoint, he's important because he takes very good notes. So after Ford becomes president, he wants to sort of uh, chart a new direction in energy. And, and we forget sometimes how much in his early statements he was focused on energy, uh, even to the point where he froze the budget one time and he says, well, it's frozen for everything except energy because we're fighting this battle for energy independence. So he realized it was complex. So he would gather his advisors every once in a while. And what an inter interesting collection of people. Uh, William Simon uh, was someone uh, who could be very outspoken, both in public and in private, very blunt <laughs> in his comments. Uh, Alan uh, Greenspan, who we later uh, knew as the head of the Federal Reserve, but was a top economic advisor under Ford. You had uh, uh, Bern Arthur Burns, who was head of the Federal Reserve Board, and then you had Kissinger. So Duval keeps these careful notes of all these meetings. And so you get, it, it, one reviewer said my book was like being a fly on the wall uh, in the Oval Office uh, at Camp David and in the palaces of the Middle East, uh, which I appreciated because that was what I was trying to be. But uh, sometimes these meets, meetings with President Ford would be at uh, Vail, Colorado, because he had uh, certain times in the winter where he loved to ski. And so they, they would go out and meet there. So you would have these arguments and, and they're very fascinating because a lot of times we don't know what people are saying in private. We know what they say in public, but we don't know what they say in private. And, and you know, if you are interested in what they say in private, the Nixon tapes are a gold mine. And I have, I think, listened to every tape where Richard Nixon talks about energy. So th these Duval notes are incredibly uh, valuable to historians. And one of the things uh, that was news to me and, and maybe news to other people was how influential Kissinger was um, uh, in influencing Ford in his decisions on energy. And it, it, I sort of mentioned this when we were discussing that earlier picture, but the, the Europeans I found with both, particularly Ford and Carter, we're, we're kind of putting pressure on us to do more because Europe during this time after the Arab oil embargo, they put on big gasoline taxes and they said, hey, Americans, what are you gonna do? Well, we, we did a number of things. We passed the automobile efficiency standards. We did the 55 mile an hour speed limit, which uh, people of my generation may, may remember. Uh, and, uh, but, but they wanted us to do more. So Kissinger in these meetings was always the one that was pushing, you know, take the bold stand, you know, socket to Congress and, and uh, uh, come out. And, and what I found was that uh, uh, Ford would uh, lean more towards uh, Kissinger's point of view than anybody else's. And um, so he was quite bold. Even at one point, he got in a fight with Congress uh, uh, by putting in by executive order uh, a, a, an import tax on imported oil, which was not popular in the Northeastern United States where they rely on heating oil and other things like that. But because of Duval's notes, you get to see Kissinger's influence uh, there. And, and, and Ford uh, really uh, backed a number of things that were very progressive. He was a strong supporter of converting uh, coal, uh, chemically altering coal, so it could be made into a liquid, li uh, liquid fuel that would uh, displace gasoline. Uh, and um, so he, um, you know, he, I, I recommend anybody who's, who's got some time and when the archives reopen, uh, you may wanna go in there and read Duvall's notes yourself, but I, I try to give a pretty good summary of, of what they said. Now, I will mention uh, one other thing that I think is incredibly important during um, the 1970s that affects us today. And that is the progress of energy technologies. Um, 
if we're going to be less dependent on uh, foreign oil, and if we're going to try to deal with the climate change issue, uh, good intentions are not enough. You, you have to uh, improve your technologies. And those technologies that might be relevant might be nuclear power, they might be solar energy, they might be wind energy, uh, they, they might be, you know, the technology of the automobile ha has to change if they're going to be more efficient and still allow the drivers to have the features that they want. So you could do worse in following energy history than just following the development of technology. So under uh, President uh, Nixon, uh, excuse me, under President, uh, yes, under President Nixon, we had the Atomic Energy Commission, which was basically in charge of all energy technology research. And of course, most of it was devoted, almost all of it to nuclear. But President Nixon proposed, and then President Ford actually uh, signed the bill that created uh, the, the Energy Research and Development Administration. And so the, the nuclear regulation went to the current Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the research part of it went to this new agency. And the money started to get split up into different things. That's when we started the research into fracking, uh, hydrological fracking. Some people like it today, some people don't. But it certainly has uh, played a role in making us less dependent on foreign oil and making us less dependent on coal for uh, electricity. So that early research that doesn't really uh, reach commercial viability uh, initially in the late 1990s, I actually visited the first well that was deemed to be commercially viable. We didn't realize how important that was at the time. But uh, that starts under Ford. And then it goes on steroids under uh, Carter, uh, because Carter passed the windfall profits tax on oil, deregulated oil, and that provided a lot of additional funding. So the, the mechanism to set up the national solar labs, it was called the Solar Energy Research Institute at the time, uh, that was set up by Ford. And then Carter uh, basically uh, was at the dedication. And then its resources were substantially clipped um, when the Reagan administration came in. But uh, even despite that, we, we did have a viable program for trying to push uh, solar technology, the, the type, the PV cells that produce electricity, and windmills, and, and the technology of windmills. You try to make the blades lighter, and you try to make them more aerodynamic. Um, <clears throat> And those things don't really pay off till the 21st century. But if you do a chart of the amount of progress that was made from uh, the early days of the technology, a lot of that progress was actually made in the 1970s. It didn't get us uh, to commercial viability, but it was the early steps of the, on the rungs on the ladder. So I think when we go back, uh, you know, we have to say that in some ways the 70s uh, has gotten a bad rap from people who, who point too much to uh, the confusion of gasoline lines and things like that and said, well, why didn't they fix that? Well, they kind of did. I, I mean, by the time Carter left office, uh, we had already cut our um, oil imports by about a quarter. And um, uh, by the early 80s, we'd cut them by uh, a half, and then we got complacent again and got dependent. Now we're not so dependent. Well, it's a long story and I uh, apologize for rambling, but uh, I, I hope everybody will find it a story that's both entertaining and enlightening. And uh, I suspect that Gleaves Whitney has some good questions for me, just like he did when I was uh, on a book tour in 2008. And, uh, and, and maybe the audience will have some as well. Thank you so much, Jay, for another really engaging talk in that you give us such great perspective for many of us who were alive in the 70s and remember the fuel shortages and you, you really bring together the politics and how the policies made so well in your book, Energy Crises. And before I go any further, I, the last time you came to Grand Rapids was back in October of 2008 when we had the privilege of hosting you. 
and you were speaking about this book, uh, Energy Independence. And I think a lot of what was in this book was read, thought about, debated, and had an impact on, on our policy because you've been in the heart of these policy debates for decades. That leads to the first question actually that's come in. You know, you speak of how books are written, but how does a career get launched? This viewer wants to know that how you launched a career as an energy guru, guru. What, <laughs> what, what did that? That might be a long story. I, you know, I've started my life as a, 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 like you, as, as a professor, um, got tenure at a fairly young age, and I was actually teaching um, um, politics in developing nations with a specialty in East Africa. And uh, in those days, political campaigns were less dependent on professional consultants. And I ended up running Jimmy Carter's campaign in, um, in uh, Louisiana in 1976. And um, so I was invited to, um, to join his administration. And I ended up at the Interior Department, which was an energy related um, department and uh, learned a bit about it. And then I went to work for the governor of Florida, Bob Graham, and I ended up becoming the state energy director uh, and then, um, and that really got me involved in the national debate because we were working with California and New York. And um, so when Bill Clinton was elected, um, I, I had federal government experience. I had worked at the White House. Uh, I'd worked at the Interior Department and I was pretty well connected with the energy experts around the country. Uh, and I, I you know, knew the Clintons from my days at the Southern Governors Conferences and things like that. So I got a chance to head the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Uh, that, that's a Senate confirmation position. Um, fortunately, the, the chairman of the committee was Bennett Johnston, who uh, was a friend of mine in Louisiana. Uh, uh, so uh, that, if you want a graduate education, you've got about 1,000 employees there at the time, if you include contractors, with specialists in every area of energy. And, but you're the one that has to usually do the press conferences and testify before Congress, but you've got all this backup. So uh, anyone wants to uh, le learn, and I mean, I knew a lot of energy when I went there, uh, obviously having been a state energy director and involved in uh, national energy issues, I served on a number of national studies in the 1980s. Um, that's, that's the place to do it. And, and it helps you think about energy systematically. I, anyone interested in energy should go to that website because it's got incredible tools, usually in layman's language, uh, to, to get up to speed on anything in energy. So that, that's the, sh the short story. Uh, in politics, uh, in every administration, you have people uh, come in and sometimes get thrown into areas where it's a little different than what they did before but you have to learn very fast and you have to learn to rely on a lot of the uh, career officials in the government who you know, have been doing it for a long time. Well, your experience across the sectors and your ability to marshal so much information really has just been a, a tribute to your ability to focus and going all the way back to, uh, I think April, 2005, when you, you, took, uh, you took me through the Carter library and uh, you know you were able to stop at every exhibit and say something really interesting about that so your mind is like a sponge for those things I'm, I'm in awe and I think many of the people who've read your books are the next question comes uh, from a viewer who asks you've written a lot about energy and U.S. policy but what was the most surprising thing you discovered when researching energy crises well it was the Saudi Arabian impact um, after the Shah was overthrown, uh, there was a fear in the US government that the Saudi government might also topple. And, and so then you would have lost both of your two pillars uh, of Middle Eastern policy uh, at this, you know, in the same year. So we did not want our um, uh, uh, discussions with the Saudi Arabians to be public. And a lot of the information in the uh, press was inaccurate. Uh, the press was reporting that the Saudis were uh, displacing the Iranian oil at times where they had quit. <laughs> so I had to go back and mine all the data 
uh, of what Saudi was, Arabia was producing at the time, how much imports we were getting from them. And then I had these diaries of these discussions and they are fascinating because uh, the, the American officials, uh, a little bit like the incident I described with Ford, Nixon and um, uh, their discussion with Egypt and, and uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, the officials would have a discussion and within 24 hours, something would happen that totally surprised them. Uh, you know, also as now I live in New Orleans and I'm kind of a foodie and, and uh, West also told us what they would eat at these meetings, which and the Saudis are gracious hosts and uh, great meals that they would have. But, but this whole Saudi relationship, uh, I think has until my book not been understood. And um, I think it needs to be understood because Saudi Arabia is not quite as important to us as they used to be in the days when we were so dependent on foreign oil, but they still are very important. And um, so learning a little bit about the members of the royal family, uh, what they were like, uh, they would have their arguments as well. A and, and, you know, generally we're not aware of this, but because of Ambassador West, uh, that information was available. So I thought that that was probably the, the major thing. Now, I, I did also have access to President Carter's diaries that haven't been published. But what I found, like Jonathan Alter, who's written a book, recent book on Carter, that most of his diaries uh, that are of greatest interest have been published. But I did, was able to get a little bit of uh, additional context on his thinking from, uh, from those diaries that have not been released yet. Um, but I think Saudi Arabia is, is probably more, a bigger part of the book than I thought it would be when I started writing it. Okay, very good. And this is a question that seeks to connect the energy crisis crises, the five crises with electoral politics. So you mentioned that there were five crises by our count there, what four of these crises occur during President Carter's uh, tenure in office, correct? Uh, yes, yes. So, here's, so mm -hmm. here's the question. It seems to have been President Carter's bad luck to be victim of four of the five energy crises how did that add up then when it comes to November 1980 and Ronald Reagan wins the election? Was it just the American people were wearied and, and, and were the energy crises one of the top issues in the 1980 election? I think that all three presidents were hurt by the energy issue uh, because energy was, um, was uh, linked to the problem of inflation. So uh, Nixon, uh, in his second term had this incredible inflation, uh, which isn't branded as an energy crisis per se, but hurt him politically at a time he was trying to wrestle with Watergate. And I think it made it more difficult for him on the Watergate issue. And you rem people who are Ford uh, experts remember the wind buttons, whip inflation now, this was a huge thing. And he had rising prices. And I think that even though he didn't have one of these crises, uh, it was not helpful to him uh, to, uh, to have this energy thing still unresolved because none of the three presidents could resolve it while they were in office. And then Carter did, I think, get dealt a tough hand. Um, the Shaw, incidentally, was diagnosed with lymphoma when Ford was president, but we never knew it. Uh, no one in the Ford administration knew it. No one in the Carter administration knew it. And it's been referred to as one of the greatest state secrets of all time, a real breakdown in intelligence. So a lot, you know, one of the problems that Carter had with the Shaw was it really wasn't possible to prop him up at that time because he was in declining health in, in ways that we didn't really understand why, but people were responding, well, you know, it doesn't sound as cogent on the phone as it used to. So all of these things are kind of intermixed. And and Carter, even, even the last thing between uh, Iran and Iraq, it was the picture on the cover of Time magazine, you know, that the Middle East is blowing up again. So that didn't help either. So, yeah, I mean, th this is um, uh, a, a tough nut for presidents to, to crack because most of the things that you do to fix it aren't going to fix it right away. And I would argue all three presidents did do meaningful things to try to fix it. 
and uh, but they didn't get the benefit because the fixes came uh, the the the, the uh, corrections came much later. Another viewer writes that the handoffs in energy policy from Nixon to Ford to Carter were all important, as you you say, you emphasize. But it seems that the handoff from Carter to Reagan was a bit rougher. Uh, there seems to be more of a break. And you, you insinuate this in one of the last chapters of your book. Could you explain? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I'll give you one example. Uh, you know, Nixon, Ford, and Carter all believed that we needed a separate Department of Energy. And so Carter generally gets the credit for uh, uh, creating the department, but it was kind of easier for him to do because before President Ford left office, he made a recommendation for the new department that was almost exactly what Carter ended up proposing, or to some extent he had already proposed it during the campaign. So when President Reagan came in, he uh, tried to abolish the Department of Energy. Uh, that didn't go over well with Congress because most people in Congress had voted to create it. So they didn't think it made much sense to, to dismantle it. And, and then these big buildups in research and development on energy, which started with Nixon, picked up speed with Ford, picked up more speed with Car uh, Carter, those started to get slashed. Well, they were very substantially slashed under Nixon or under, excuse me, Reagan. And uh, again, presidential junkies may remember the name David Stockman, and he was the uh, budget director for, um, uh, for Reagan, at least at first. And his mission was to get the government out of just about anything he could. So there was a whole different mentality. And that's, I do have a chapter on Reagan. I, I actually wrote four chapters on Reagan, but, uh, you, you know, in the, uh, to, uh, meet the needs of brevity, I, I boiled it down to one because we, we tend to look today at the difference between the Republicans and Democrats. But in some ways, when you look at this, the differences are differences in decades. And, and I found more similarities between Nixon, Ford, and Carter than I expected to find. Uh, but again, then you have this sharp break in the 80s where, when people are looking at things quite differently. That is a fascinating point that the essential fault lines in the early part of our careers was in the decades. Um, and yes, I'm gonna think about that. That is an excellent observation that I think certainly bears the, uh, the, the way of the evidence. Um, there's a very interesting question coming in from Linda Soltis. Uh, she uh, writes that given the uh, Canadian American energy independence that's existed for so long, what role did Canada play during this time? Well, that was another surprise. You know, I, I look before the Arab oil embargo, we had all these contingency plans that were written. What would we do if there was an embargo? And uh, so I go into that because I, I, I like to see, well, how do we prepare for things or not prepare for things? And then what actually happens? So one of the uh, uh, the, the key assumptions was that if the Middle East oil is cut off, we got Venezuela and Canada in this hemisphere, and so we're protected. And one person, uh, it was actually uh, one of the oil companies, said that won't work because Canada, we, we import oil from Canada, the Western provinces, Alberta, but on the Eastern provinces, they import oil from uh, the Middle East. So if there's a shortage, Canada's not gonna give the oil to us. They're gonna take the oil, maybe even that they send to us, send it through the Panama Canal to the Eastern provinces. Well, that's what happened. So we actually got cut off, <laughs> cut back on the oil from Canada, whereas we had assumed going into the crisis that that was the cushion that was gonna help us survive. So, you know, part of it was, you know, when you hear these tapes, uh, Richard Nixon did not like Elliot Trudeau, you know, the, the father of the current prime minister. Uh, something about it, he, that's one reason he didn't want the old pipeline going through Canada because he didn't want to deal with Trudeau. So th this is one of those things about we all have to be humble when we think we have a plan worked out for when the next emergency rises because uh, if, if Canada cut us off, which you know is our closest ally in many ways, uh, you, you know, we were more vulnerable than we thought we were. Yes, well, 
here's a really nice comment that's going to make your month. It comes from from uh, Karen Stokes, Karen Henry Stokes, and she writes that this is such a fascinating presentation, Dr. Hakes. You've made us all feel that we've been flies on the walls of presidential meetings. Thank you, Jay, from someone who has followed your career since your days at Duke and East Africa. Karen, Karen you, you, when I was there in 2008, she was out of town because I, I wanted to say hello. Uh, she, she was such a good friend. I, you know, as, as uh, uh, struggling graduate students, we uh, uh, always had a competition to see who could uh, eat on the least amount of money <laughs> spent at the grocery store so we could make it through graduate school. And uh, Karen was really good at that. So thank you so much for listening. <laughs> thank you, Karen. All right, here are a couple of more questions. A viewer writes that many things are cyclical in the economy and politics and probably even energy. Throughout your career, have you found that there is an ebb and flow with energy policy? And if so, how does that affect politics and the American people? That's another really important point that, um, that um, uh, I try to elucidate in the book. And uh, I could give many examples, but, but let me give you one. OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, it's founded in 1960. Uh, we assume they have no power, we kind of make fun of it, but they're kind of making plans to take over the oil companies in their, uh, within their borders. And so then with the Arab oil embargo, they become this big powerhouse because they find by cutting production, that the price per barrel goes up so much that they actually make more money. So at that point, we assume that OPEC is this power, you know, how do you deal with OPEC? Well, we did some things. We cut back on uh, big gas guzzler cars. We built the Alaska pipeline. And, and then in the 80s, 1980s, the price of oil collapses and OPEC becomes nothing. And OPEC was sort of a, a non-powerful group until late, uh, I'd say about uh, 1999 or 2000 uh, for a number of reasons. One is Iran and Saudi Arabia temporarily decided to bury the hatchet. So OPEC became strong again, and then now it's relatively weak again. So there is this cycl cyclical pattern. And I think one of the reasons I think it's important to recognize is we tend to th see things as inevitable. You know, when OPEC is strong, we think, well, they're strong, there's nothing we can do about it, or they're weak, so we don't have to worry about that. And when you get this sense that things can change, and sometimes there are things that you can do uh, to make uh, things change the way you want them to do, uh, then, um, you know, it, it gives us a, a different perspective. So yeah, the historical perspective, particularly for a, a commodity like oil, is is a really dominant feature. Okay, and one of our Michigan Teachers of the Year who's viewing asked this question. President Ford said to the American people, some of the best ideas come from your home rather than from the White House. And President mm -hmm. Ford asked for citizens to share their ideas for energy conservation. Jay, do you know if any of the ideas or suggestions from the American public made their way and impacted energy policy? Thanks, Claire, for that question. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, you, you know, um, Carter uh, grew up uh, in in Georgia, uh, rural Georgia, before they had electricity coming to the home, <laughs> and it was the uh, TV or the uh, rural electrification program. So that that had a strong impact on him. I can't really answer that impact uh, that uh, question. Uh, for the Ford administration. I do know that Betty Ford and, and Rosalind Carter were on the road together campaigning for the Equal Rights Amendment uh, and, and later uh, campaigned for mental health legislation. And that, that's a clear place uh, where the, the spouses uh, came in. But, um, but you know, Carter, um, he preached, it, it, all three of these presidents in the 70s preached the need for sacrifice. And you talk about another gap between the 1970s and the 80s. I define you to find a president, Republican or Democrat, since 1980, that's called, called on the American people to sacrifice to achieve something in energy. That word disappears. But the, the, that group through the 70s 
a lot of them were World War II veterans. And now Carter was in a class at the Naval Academy where they were speeded up. He graduated in three years so they could fight in World War II. But by the time he graduated, they, um, uh, the war had been won. And so he went to work for Admiral Rickover developing nuclear submarines. So, the, you know, Ford and Carter particularly, they were gutsy. I mean, a lot, a lot of pollsters would say, don't ask people to sacrifice. It sounds like you're blaming them. Um, and I think we miss that today, but every individual decision we make about energy has an impact. So there are times when I kind of wish our presidents were more like the presidents of the 1970s. We're winding down to just a couple of more questions that we can ask that we have time for. One of our viewers asks about uh, your next book. What do you want to write about next? Thank you. <laughs> I, I, uh, I've been at work for, for several years uh, uh, when I get a few spare moments to study the climate change issue from Dwight Eisenhower to uh, Bill Clinton. Uh, and people say, Eisenhower administration, they weren't talking about climate change back then. Well, they were. And even I, I'm able to document that people at the White House, uh, Eisenhower White House were aware of the climate change issue. And a lot of the early scientific studies that we rely on today were done while Ike was president. So um, I've, I've located the uh, syllabus of Al Gore when, for the course he took at Harvard from Roger Revelle, the great climate scientist, and interviewed his section leader and got a lot of archival research done before COVID. And hopefully in dealing with it in, um, in the 20th century, I can, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying not to get involved in the current debate, although this obviously has huge implications for the current debate. So that book, I hope, won't take me as long to write as the book that came out in April. Uh, and I uh, hope everyone will look for that. Well, Jay, you're a great historian of energy policy. This question, though, is going forward, what should we be doing in our energy policy to maximize our security, efficiency, environmental concerns, and so forth? Yeah, I, there's a long and short answer because, uh, as I say, there's no silver bullet to energy policy, but there's a lot of silver buckshot. But if you want what the priority should be, uh, I would say that we want to get our um, uh, electric grid running on non-carbon polluting sources. Uh, and I think we're moving faster on that than a lot of people thought we could, and we can move even faster. And then we want to electrify everything. You know, like in New Orleans, we've got a port and they've got these diesel hoists. Uh, those can be electrified. And we can, of course, uh, the, uh, President Biden was at the Ford plant recently uh, touting the electric cars that uh, our American manufacturers are going to do. So if we have our transportation being powered by clean energy, uh, that's a big part of it. So, uh, you know, it's kind of exciting. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm kind of a techie and it's so much fun to watch all these new technologies coming along. We just need to nudge them even faster. And I think we can get to where we want to be. Well, we've hit the eight o'clock mark, Jay. And I just want to say thank you for another wonderful program. You and I go back about 15, 16 years. Uh, you never fail to both enlighten and delight with your clear explanations of what's going on in our world and help us interpret it and cope with it better. Thank you for bringing your A game to our program this evening. I uh, also want to thank Brooke Clement and our great, great partners uh, at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum for helping co-host this evening's program. I want to remind people that if you find value in such programs, please go to the uh, website, go to the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation and sign up to be a friend of Ford. And you see that on your screen, a friend of Ford. And while I'm talking about the good colleagues I work with, and Jay, I know you know Don Holloway as well. Uh, Don's just a great curator at the uh, Gerald R. Ford. He's going to be retiring. But before he retires tomorrow night, he is going to be giving a program talking about uh, the Gerald R. Ford presidency and, and President Ford's life in a National Archives program. So we're looking very forward to that. Sign up for that if you get a chance. Jay, thank you so much for your appearance this evening.